Hey, what's going on everyone? This is Tim Vixay with My Crippled Friend, and this is episode number 36. Uh, We're down here in uh, Boynton Beach, Florida, and I'm over at one of my crippled friends' house. His name is Carlos Leon. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, Tim. Good to see you, man. Man, it's been a while. I was trying to figure out uh, when the last time I saw you, and it it wasn't Columbia, right? Um, Cause that was 2016. I feel like that's just way too far. That might be way too far. I was thinking Philadelphia, but that maybe that was even like the vet games. Yeah, the vet games. Oh, that was like 2014. Yeah. <laughs> when was uh? What was your last vet games that you went to? Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, so maybe it was Columbia. I can't believe it's been that long. It's been that long. Um, no, I actually I wanted to start this podcast with just some advice, um, and some good advice. Is if your crippled friend asks you for a restaurant recommendation, make sure they got low tables. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I the the last time that I was down in the Keys, um, I I just couldn't remember. It's just something that you they don't had think like about. four high tables. So for those that don't know what I'm talking about, which is everyone, <laughs> I uh, I've been down in fl- I've been in Florida most of this month and went down to. Key West and then linked up with Carlos uh just through text and I was like, Man, what uh what are some good restaurants? And you recommended a, a ramen joint. And it was weather, it was a little cold, so I was like, dude, ramen's gonna hit the spot. <laughs> and so, you know, we parked and did that whole thing, found the found the restaurant and I opened the door and it's like three or four high tables and a bar and an upstairs area and I was just like, That mother <laughs> that walking motherfucker <laughs> Um, cause that's, uh, that's one unique thing about like your injury, right? Um, you're, are you a C6? I'm a C5. C5. Okay. Uh, Super incomplete. Very incomplete. Yeah. I'm, I'm a C5 incomplete as well, but mm-hmm. as far as movement and function, not a, but, uh, yeah. let's, um, let's take it back and, um, well, okay, first of all, you, you're you also a, a Marine veteran, um, so right. we'll, we'll get that one out of the way real quick. Um, what'd you do in the Marines? So, um, in the Marine Corps, I was a uh, parachute rigger. Um, for those of you that don't know what that what that is, it's uh, basically um, someone that tends to pack in the parachutes and anything to do with air operations, so mm-hmm. fast roping, repelling, uh, 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 what we call heavy pack and light pack. The difference is, um, uh, as a parachute rigger, y- you either get put on a heavy pack unit or a light pack unit. Heavy being when you drop big Humvees, yeah, big crates, you know, uh, supplies, things of that nature, where you're using very big parachutes. Uh, and then of course, light pack is uh, personal parachutes. So for people, yeah, uh, I was a light pack parachute rigger. Um, uh, so I was attached to a unit, uh, third radio battalion out of Hawaii, um, where was, I was stationed there for, for, for a few years. Uh, I was attached to a radio reconnaissance unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was in charge of, uh, maintaining and packing and of course jumping with, uh, a a radio recon team out of Hawaii. And, uh, it's, it's, it's a very unique job. There's not a lot of jobs in the Marine Corps, that have to do with jumping out of aircrafts. Um, it's mainly something that you see in the army. Yeah. Um, but uh, not so much in the Marine Corps. So I was very fortunate to uh, uh, have such a unique position. That's cool. And I didn't even know you um, that you got to jump too. Like, oh yeah. so you got to go on like some missions and stuff. And a- absolutely. Um, uh, to be clear, I am not a recon marine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was uh, attached to a recon unit. Uh, so, uh, that's another unique position, whereas, uh, other support or logistics jobs, you have nothing to do with the, with the team itself. Yeah. You're very removed from it. Uh, whereas parachute riggers, we're directly involved with the mission. Yeah. It's we're a little more like hands-on support. Very, like very, very much, uh, hands-on, uh, to the point to where you're actually even going on missions with the guys. Yeah. So uh, now are these guys generally like, uh, how do they view you? Cause I know like O threes and especially recon guys, they kind of, they're, they're really protective about their like identity. Like, Hey, if you're going to roll with us, you got to look good. Right. You know? Right. Uh, th- 
it's I'm very glad that you brought that up um, because within the service of those that know uh, and of course those that know will um, you're absolutely right those guys that have those very elite positions or even a position where you're a uh, a, a grunt or you're you're on on the lines and you're a, a war fighter or something like that uh, they're very protective of that um, so you're right at first they kind of <laughs> give you a hard time, you know, uh, because they want to make sure that you can pull your weight and that you can quote unquote roll with the guys. Uh, so I- in order to kind of avoid all of that, the rigor himself has to go through some schools. Okay. Um, so typically, um, you would have to also go through the selection process. Uh, you would have to go through the screening if you want to, um, this like selection for, the actual recon unit for so the like actual recon unit exactly brc um you can go to brc i did not go to brc um but usually there's in-house screening process okay right so then uh, and this is the exact same process that a recon marine would go through yeah um you would also go through some elite schools if there's seats available mm-hmm. then the unit will send the rigor off to some of those schools so Sears school, dive school. Uh, Did you get to go to any of those? I got to go to some of the, um, so yes, I, uh, I got to go to elite parachute schools. Okay. So, um, whereas some of us got to go to Sears school and some other schools like that. Um, I went to, um, parachuting schools, um, because I felt that I wanted to be very good at my job. I wanted to be a, a, an, excellent parachute rigger and not just you know go to a school where i know that i'm probably never going to use what i learned yeah because that has nothing to do with my mos um i chose to go to schools that directly reflected what i did uh so one of the main schools that i went to was uh hearst school hearst master school uh uh hearst stands for helicopter rope suspension training master um basically those are the people that uh are masters in repelling mm-hmm. uh, is this an army school or is this a um this, or is this one, a private this is a marine corps elite school oh, okay. yeah uh in the army i believe that school is called um air assault oh, okay air assault like i believe air assault course or something air assault course but that's just the course for the people to learn how to repel yeah this course that I went to was to learn to be an instructor at one of those schools. So oh, okay. It's a little more uh, intense. Uh, and uh, th- that uh, that was crucial because in real world operations, for the most part, we're not really doing a lot of combat jumps these days. You know, I mean, I wouldn't know, but, you know, may in the movies, maybe like really high elite special forces, maybe those guys are doing yeah. combat jumps. But for the typical unit, they're not doing combat jumps these days, as far as I know. Uh, but what they are doing, they are repelling into, they are fast roping onto mm-hmm. the tops of compounds or anything like that. So uh, again, that's another example of why I wanted to do a school that would further uh, my capabilities as a parachute rigger. Yeah, it adds right. like kind of more just tools for your toolbox and Correct. makes you more kind of versatile and gives you ma- makes you more of an asset to the team. Exactly to to my actual job, mm-hmm. not just oh I got to go to Sears school and I got the snot beat out of me by some fake Russians in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. Right. Like, sure, the, you know you, you learn survival and some other cool stuff, but you know you we can learn that in house as well. So. Yeah. So how many how many jumps do you think you have under your belt? That's a good I question. Mean, over over the course of a career. Over the course of a career, I probably you know unfortunately my accident uh, took place uh, three and a half years into my uh, into my first uh, uh, enlistment. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I would say that I probably have something like thirty. Okay. Thirty, uh, which which is not much, but in the Marine Corps is not bad either right that doesn't seem like a lot compared to some of the other um guys i know that are like airborne and stuff but right then it's also like wait you're a marine we're supposed to be amphibious so exactly exactly i mean i've i've never been in a military plane so Mm -hmm. i mean i kept i was uh amtrak so we you know kept our ass in the water yeah Uh, yeah 
But man, that's cool. Um, so you mentioned with your accident, did did that happen in Hawaii or? It did. So I was, um, I, we deployed to uh, Iraq in 2004 to 2005. I was, uh, I did the uh, fifth, uh, 15th MU. So mm-hmm. uh, for those uh, that don't know, a MU stands for Marine Expeditionary Unit. Yep. And uh, so when we came back from our tour in, um, I think, May of uh, 05, um or May or June of 05, I had my accident just a few weeks after that. Yeah. In Hawaii. So, yeah. What what uh what happened? Again? So, so uh b- basically it was uh it was just a freak diving accident. I um a wave was coming in. I was in the water, maybe about anywhere between knee to waist deep water. Big wave was coming. So, as one does, you know, you kind of like run towards the wave and just kind of dive underneath the the, the the wave but uh unfortunately there was a a, a rock underneath the surface of the water oh, so shit. as soon as i put my head in the water and kind of like pushed off to you know start swimming uh i pushed off head on right onto the rock yeah uh, so uh, that that caused the uh big laceration to the top of my head and uh, uh, a, a compound burst fracture to my fifth vertebrae and that's that pretty it. similar to what happened with me mm-hmm. I was just swimming in the ocean and, and dove into a wave Jeez. And then hit my head on a sandbar and very um, similar. Yeah. Did um did you get that kind of feeling like you just hit your funny bone just from the neck down, or do you remember any of this? So I do remember uh uh I I didn't I was not knocked unconscious. Um I didn't have that feeling where you know you feel that tingly. I just didn't feel anything. Uh it was basically uh like everything just kind of shut off. And I was just floating, you know, yeah. um, uh, I was, I basically, I, I think the medical report, uh, from one of my friends that was there, the, the gentleman that saved, that pulled me out of the water, uh, he was actually in my unit and, um, he said that I was probably in the water for about a minute or less. Anywhere okay. Between 50 you got fortunate. To a, to a minute. Yeah. Uh, but I was holding my breath. So it yeah. was, uh, you know, that minute felt. Dude, that's Pretty exactly long. what happened with me. Yeah. But uh, I was, I, I felt like I was under for, it had to have been over four minutes holding my breath. Because um, I remember thinking, I was like, I'm about to drown. Um, and and yeah. back then I was able to hold my breath for close to five minutes. I, I'll say 4.30. And I remember thinking like, fuck, I'm going to drown. And then yeah. uh, uh, I just remember thinking like, you know, if this, this is the, if this is the time, then this is the time. And like I... Fortunately, you know, I called my mom this morning, which happens maybe once every two weeks. Jeez. I called her, so at least I got to talk to her, tell her I love her, and and then you know if this is it, this is it. And uh, my same thing, my buddy in, in my unit came over, thought I was fucking around, yeah. and uh, you know, I was like, dude, what are you doing? And I just kind of like w- was able to, once the wave kind of tossed me, I was like, yo, yo, I'm fucked up. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess. Similar to me, I, um, very similar. Uh, I, I was getting really thirsty, man. I was about to start drinking some water. I, oh, I wow. Was, I was really, I was about to go. Um, and, uh, w- what happened to me is that I, I had a really big, uh, in, in Hawaii, the, the rock there, it's, it's coral rock. So it's yeah. really sharp. So, uh, it, it, I didn't fracture my skull, but I did lacerate my scalp. Oh yeah. So I was putting a lot. You got a good scar from that? or I do have a good scar from that, actually. Dang, I don't think I've ever seen this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think the last time you saw me, I had hair. Yeah. So then, <laughs> so you never, you never saw that, but, uh, um, uh, so then I started putting a lot of blood into the water. Mm-hmm. So my friend, uh, Chris, uh, which was, uh, on the, uh, on the bank there, he, s- he thought, in fact, that I was being attacked by a shark. Oh, because all the blood? A lot of blood. Yeah. A lot of blood in the water. And, uh, so he, bolted you know into the water pulled me out and uh i was able to tell him right away that i can't feel or move my body and thank god for marines man because right? if he was a civilian he'd be like uh, <laughs> hey i'm gonna go get help uh, you stay there yeah exactly no no he um he uh he did everything right you know um he he uh, was able to stabilize my neck mm-hmm. immobilize my head i yep. mean he did everything right he kept me calm he kept me awake uh and he got the ambulance it felt like an eternity but i'm I'm sure they probably 
where they are within. Yeah, because little things like that, I mean, like, you know, if, let's say, he just came in and just grabbed you and jerked you around, you know, you could have damaged your spinal cord and been, a, you know, a real C5. A real C5, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, so that was, um, it was a, a, a crazy time, but, uh, you know, uh, that was then and, you know. Right. Did you... Um, now, did you went to a hospital in, in Hawaii, obviously, but did they fly you back stateside for? Yeah, they did. So um, I was um, I was taken to a, a, a hospital right there in Waikiki called uh, Queens Medical Center. Mm-hmm. And uh, when my um, CO came to visit me and some other people from the unit, from the Marines, came to visit me, uh, they saw that they, um, they gave me the advice to stay at the civilian hospital uh, because there's in Hawaii as you would imagine that type of injury is kind of common with surfers with yeah oh yeah so uh, the doctors there um, know how to treat that whereas if they would have taken me to the to the VA at Hawaii they're not as skilled so the surgery they were just they just wanted to make sure that they had that their marine was in the best capable hands. Mm-hmm. So I stayed there. They did my fusion surgery at that hospital. Uh, and I think within a week or so after the surgery, um, they flew me uh, from Hawaii to Miami. They transferred me to the Miami VA. Uh, you know, so the, the, ac- the accident was, uh, I think, uh, June 15th of 05 or June 18th of 05. And I don't know why I remember this date, but the day that I got to uh, Miami, rather, it was uh, July 7th, so... 7-7, um, seven, seven, I mean, it's yeah, easy one. 7-7, seven, seven, exactly, so uh, so I was, in fact, transferred, but after the surgery, after my kind of, mm-hmm. everything kind of stabilized, then, uh, then I did my physical therapy in Miami. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah I mean, because I guess, if, I guess knowing what you know now, like, uh, especially knowing what I know now, I probably would have chose Tampa. Right. But I don't know anything about the Miami VA, so right. how would you maybe rate that healthcare system? Because you're from this area. Right, right. So, right. I mean, that, that makes sense. That's going to be something you're going to, you know, consider. Right. Um, and that's a good good question. Or uh, uh, so, so then really two things came into account when I decided to transfer to Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was family. And as we all know, when you have a good support system, it counts for so much in yeah. your recovery process. You know, if it's friends, uh, more importantly, if it's family. Uh, and uh, I was uh, raised in a really tight family, you know, so it was really important to me to have my parents and my direct, you know, my closest family close to me. Whereas, you know, Tampa, I, I live in an area of Florida where Tampa is about four hours away from me. Yeah. So then having a four hour commute maybe even on the daily basis uh, or weekly basis. Uh, right. It, it would have been a little tough for some of them because people still work. You know, yeah, they that's, can't a, just, I mean, that's a big it's a big toll, so, a big sacrifice that they're going to have to make. Right, right. So that was uh, probably the, f- the more important one, um, but it was definitely one of the reasons. And, and the other reason is um, uh, uh, the, the Miami VA is kind of situated in a really unique position in Miami where across the street is uh, – the Jackson Memorial, uh, and that hospital is one of the world-leading hospitals in spinal cord. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Uh, in fact, Christopher Reed, which is, you know, the Superman, yeah, he did his therapy there, and his, you know, uh, he basically funded research in spinal cord rehabilitation mm-hmm. at Jackson Memorial. And uh, um, so because of that, the VA spinal cord unit and Jackson, they work hand in hand. Oh, that's great. Uh, so um, I was able to be seen by both yeah. VA doctors and specialists at the uh, at the Jackson Memorial Hospital, and uh, so th- I, I I felt really confident that my care would have been yeah nothing less than excellent. So now, how long did it take for you to start getting some things back and right? Um, due to the nature of my uh, accident and being so incomplete. It was probably, so, you know, my accident was in, in June. Um, I would probably say that by August, I started getting pretty good mobility in my upper body. Uh, and, and by pretty good, I'm talking about, like, 
very small movements, you know, but for a spinal cord injury, very small movements are, you know. Yeah, they're just, they're, you might not realize it then, but it's yeah. like milestones. Like milestones. I mean, that was me with um, when I started getting kind of like strength in my wrist back. And they were like, dude, this is huge. I'm like, what are you talking about? It only goes one way. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this one way that I have it with the flexion, it's like it helps with the tenodesis. Yeah. Then I started getting the sensation back. And I was like, what the fuck do I want sensation for? I yeah. <laughs> want to walk. And they're yeah. like, well, you know, later down the road, you're going to. You're going to know, it's going to be awesome when you know that, hey, my shoes are on too tight or yeah. my butt's sore. I'm sitting on, you know, car keys or exactly. my cell phone or whatever. Exactly. So like, exactly. Yeah, every little bit just really does help. Every little know? bit helps. And uh, I think I was walking within a year. And by walking, I mean I would be able to stand for like 10 seconds and maybe shuffle my left foot an inch mm-hmm. and then shuffle my right foot a half inch. You yeah. Know? It, it really wasn't that, um, but the fact that I was able to do that, it then motivated me to want to do it more. Yeah. And uh, so I, I was a kind of weird case, I think, I don't know, um, where I didn't want to stop doing therapy. Like I wanted to, I didn't want to rest. I just wanted to continue to, right. to try and improve. Um, and uh, could that have been bad i don't know uh, so good, at don't this know. point like well y- while you're in miami did you mm-hmm. think um that you're going to get back to active duty or anything or um no 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 i knew that i was uh, uh i i knew that i would have i was going to be medically retired i um i didn't really have any illusions of oh, okay you know i'm going to be in therapy for a year and then i'm going to be running marathons within a couple years no i i, I knew the the severity of the gravity of the, having a spinal cord injury. Um, even though I was a young guy, I was 20 years old when the accident happened. Um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that how serious the injury mm-hmm. uh, is. Um, and uh, uh, the similarities between our accidents are so crazy. Cause I was, yeah. I was 20 as well, just a yeah. month shy from my 21st birthday. Wow. Um, but yeah, no, I, I had that, like that little nugget where it's just like, you know, okay, they're going to, transfer me from the ICU to the VA hospital. Right. And then I'm going to start getting some sensation back, some feeling back, some movement back, wiggle my toes, get up on the parallel bars. And this is all going to be just one big, you know, training montage. And then I'm going to be back, you know, uh, back with my unit. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually thought we were going to, we had a, we had a a mew coming up, a float coming up. And I was like, oh, dude, I'm going to be on that. What do you, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Keep all my shit. Keep on your shit. Keep all my shit fucking, cleaned and i'm gonna i'll I'll be back soon yeah i don't know i forget it wasn't until maybe two months at the va so i got injured in july and i think by like october i was like well that was a really short kind of career um i guess this is it i'm going to go home and figure out what the next chapter is and like i had no idea what i was going to do next right did um, did you get introduced to like any sports or anything while you were in Miami? Or it's uh, that's a good segue, Jim. Uh, Tim, uh, <laughs> seems Jim. like you've done this. I don't know where that came from. Uh, seems like you've done this a few times, but uh, in, you're you're, I was, I was, and it came from a therapist at the VA. Yeah, and um, you know, at back then it was uh, two thousand and five. Uh, we the Miami VA it's primarily you know Vietnam guys World War II guys and there's not that many of those those guys left but uh, back then there was a few more than they are now uh, and uh, so I couldn't really relate to any of the guys I think I had like two guys from from uh, the conflict that yeah like our generation our generation right. yeah. and uh, it it um it, it was hard for me to even though I did it I just didn't I just I wasn't comfortable being around the the older guys. So yeah. And my therapist saw that and she uh she got word that the uh US Paralympic Committee and the and the Department of Defense were gonna do a co op and they were gonna do a sports program out in San Diego. Um and it, at back then it was called the Paralympic Sports Summit, you know, they're they're called different now. 
uh, and uh, basically is they were going to take vets that were severely injured um, or, you know, just injured at all from the Iraq um, war, and they were going to just teach them about adaptive sports, you know, um, mm-hmm. or at least get them, ac- you know, ac- uh, active again and show them that they can still be active. And yeah. And uh, so they flew my father and I out to San Diego um, to their big Olympic training grounds down there. In, um, Chula Vista? Chula Vista, yep. that's right, yeah. And, uh, you know, we learned, we, you know, we played volleyball and we played uh, uh, um, ba- wheelchair basketball and they threw us in the water and that was my first time actually in a swimming pool since my accident. So that was amazing. Um, you know, and the, the track and field and yeah. o- other archery, other sports like that. Um, it really felt like we were at like a vets game. Of course I didn't know what a vets game was at that point, still, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was incredible. And, uh, I met a lot of, um, people there that will later become some of my greatest mentors and friends. Uh, one of the people that I met that um, I not only uh, consider him my greatest mentor, but one of my greatest friends is a gentleman that you also know and that we've played rugby with, Gabriel Diaz de Leon. Oh, dude, solid guy. Solid guy. And uh, he was basically the guy that was in charge of the track and field portion of yeah. that event um, uh, for – for your viewers, uh, Gabriel Diaz de Leon is a five-time Paralympic athlete. Yeah. And uh, he's been to more than five Paralympics. He's been doing it since, I think, 88. I know he's been playing rugby since 88. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think his first Paralympics were, was in 88. Yeah, that's so insane. Um, and I got to uh, get him on the show soon. Yeah. <laughs> he's, I'm, I'm sure he's got some fucking awesome stories. Yeah. And yeah. then just life lessons. Just, yeah, exactly. Just the way he approaches exactly. everything. Yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, basically, he took me in, uh, you know, he, for whatever reason, he and I really connected, um, you know, from... uh, That's got to be a Latino thing. Probably Hispanic thing, yeah. But also, like, quads, stick with quads. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, the the, the field portion of that that day, and uh, he he threw me up on his personal throwing chair, and and, uh, I probably threw his shot put. I probably threw the shot put like three feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it was something, you know, not very exciting. But he saw, I guess he saw something in, in my effort, you know, how I really wanted to mm-hmm. to do well. And, um, you know, uh, after that, that day session, he came to me and uh, he said that he saw something in me, you know, um, that if through hard work, if I, if I really dedicate myself, that – you know, that y- the sport could take me places. Yeah. And, uh, of course, you know, I'm a young 20-year-old Marine, you know, and he was just, I guess he, he sweet-talked me, you know. I was, I was just mesmerized. I was like, oh, my goodness, you know. I, yeah. I mean, I, I can be a Paralympian. Did you um, did you do any sports um, as an able body? I did. Uh, we played um, in my, f- well, I'm, I'm Colombian. Nation- my nationality is Colombian. And uh, so, you know, soccer is... Uh, is like the law. Yeah, it's yeah. like required. It's required. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely required. And uh, so I, I, I played, uh, you know, uh, uh, soccer. Oh, we have a guest. Oh, got a oh, special we guest. We have a special guest for our viewers. This is Nyla. Hi, Nyla. Oh, oh my come on goodness. Over. Oh, she's yeah. friendly. Oh, she's a friendly one. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Okay. Yeah, Nyla. Nyla is. Uh, Four years old. She is a ball of energy. Dude, she loves oh, everyone. She is friendly. Yeah. A lot of these small dogs, man. They just I know like it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Go say papa. Say hi to papa. Oh no, no. When she has guests, when we have guests over, yeah, I'm, I'm a stranger. Yeah, she doesn't. She's not gonna get all excited and pee on me, is she? Uh, no, uh, no. Won't be a problem. I already peed on myself today. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me so long to get here, man. I had to pull over twice to pee. Jeez. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, we, um, talked, going back to, to Gabe, he, uh, basically, uh, told me, you know, just work hard, man, and, uh, and maybe you can do it. That, that was the summer of 2006. That was one year yeah. post-injury. And That's when uh, I graduated. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, okay. basically, 
he was kind of impressed with my effort. So he let me have his personal throwing chair. You went down? He let me take it. He let me take it home, and he gave me some throwing implements. Um, he gave me a couple shot puts. He gave me a couple discs, and uh, he just said, "Hey, man, work hard," you know, and uh, you know, um, go to some of the local throwing events, get qualified, get a get get a uh, get uh, categorized. So for our viewers, um, I don't know. I'm sure you've kind of talked it with other athletes but uh in the throwing world it's also the same where you get a medical examination they yeah. kind of categorize you uh where you belong and uh and then you go from there and then you compete against people with your same level of fun of, of ability yeah right? i think you might be the first i don't want to disrespect anyone but I th right you're definitely the first paralympian thrower oh, right on um, yeah so basically the way it works is um you you get a a, a a team um, that's trained in uh, they're usually physical therapists, sometimes doctors. Uh, you want back up and uh, and uh, they give you a test. They kind of test muscle function and range of motion. Can't pick you up like your dad does. Like that. Yeah. So what class did you compete in? So early on in my career, since I was just a year removed from my accident, I started out as a F fifty two, which is basically almost the lowest level of quad class if you will yeah and uh that's where i started i ended my career as a 53 actually i think i started as a 51 and then i i as time went on and i started rehabilitating and getting better and stronger yeah my classes i would go up in class so i ended my career as a 53 um but uh, uh so then i uh, early on i got class as a 51 and um you know, uh, uh, I think within a couple of months, there was a big event in uh, in Georgia, and uh, I wanted to go. I mm -hmm. wanted to just kind of see how I kind of placed in in the throwing world. Yeah. In, th in this case, just nationally. And uh, it turns out that I did really well. And uh, I qualified to go to the U.S. Championships uh, that year. Uh, and I did. And uh, I did really well. And I made it. I qualified to my first big international event. I made the uh, U.S. team. And I competed in Brazil in the Pair Pan American Games in 2007. So just two years after my accident. That's uh, incredible. I was competing uh, internationally. At that event, I won the uh, silver medal in the discus. And I won the bronze medal in the shot put. Nice. And uh, that basically was the beginning of my athletic career. Uh, that year when I came back, I threw so well, in fact, in Brazil that I qualified to go to my first Paralympic Games in 2008. Yeah. And, and I competed. So in I mean, that's game. like three years. Three years, basically post. three years post-accident. And I was there. And it was all due to Gabriel Diaz de Leon and just, you know, instilling confidence in someone with a simple man you really got it in you bro all you got to do is just work a little hard yeah have a little discipline in your bones and get it done now in between the like all that time did you um like did you work with any coaches or like a, at, at the local level like was that available for you like that's a good question um at that point in my quote-unquote career it wasn't a career at that point but um I didn't. I just basically did everything on my own. My father, you know, would go out to the field with me and, and he would help me stake in my throwing chair mm -hmm. and, and pick up the stuff after I threw it. Um, I just tried to remember everything that Gabe taught me at the camp yeah. and just repeat. Um, and so, so early on I did not. Um, after we came back from after I came back from from Brazil, though, things did change. Um, I was given an opportunity to live and train in Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. And uh, there's a great <coughs> excuse me, facility out there called uh, the Lakeshore Foundation. Oh, man, your picture's still all over the dorms. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> it's beautiful. Every it's time I have breakfast, <laughs> yeah. it's like, good morning, Carlos. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was very flattering. I was very, um, you know, uh, honored when I saw that. And uh, 
um, yeah, so I, so then I lived there for a year, and there's a university, um, a private university that's very close to the Lakeshore Foundation called Sanford University. Yep. And uh, their uh, head coach, I think then was assistant head coach, or he may even been their head coach for their track and field. He was actually contracted out by the U.S. Paralympics to train myself and a couple of the throwers that were uh, would commute to get training from 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 him. And uh, so after after Brazil is when I started getting actual coaching. And uh, it was because of his coaching that uh, I was able to improve my skills and, again, com- uh, 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 compete and, and qualify to, yeah. to go to the Paralympics. And uh, so after that, that's when... Now, did you only just focus on shot put, or was there other things that you kind of were interested in doing? Um. I, my main focus was the discus, in fact. Okay. Yeah, my main focus was the dis- di- discus, in fact. And at that point, I was an F-52. And, um, y- you know, w- when I got to to the Paralympics, since it was my first Paralympics, they still want to make sure that they have their professionals kind of give you a once-over and make sure that you're classified mm-hmm. exactly where you belong. And um, uh, I don't want to say unfortunately, but... I'm the one telling the story, goddammit. So, unfortunately, um, they felt that I was a little too strong in my category. Yeah. And they, in fact, moved me up uh, to the F-53s. Um, th- from so, so then what does that do? The, the discus n- doesn't really change anything other than you're throwing against people that are throwing further, but the implement itself is the same. Right. Right. For the shot put, though, the implement gets bigger and it gets heavier. Oh, really? Right. So... Uh, that presents that presents another set set of issues. Um, w- the big problem was is that my main focus was the discus. So because the people are throwing further, that means that the qualifying standards are further, mm-hmm. and I've never thrown those qualifying standards. So when I got to Beijing and I got classified higher, I was unqualified to compete in the discus because I didn't qualify to throw the discus at that category. Yeah. So then, in fact, in Beijing, I never threw the discus. Dang, so they didn't even... Right. Like, you feel like they would have figured all this out before you even made the trip over. That's exactly right. And yeah. we we did. We got tested before mm-hmm. we went, and they felt that I was in the correct uh, uh, category. Um, so then, but why was I able to throw the shot put is that I was able to throw that distance. Yeah. So I, I qualified in that distance for the shot put. So I was still qualified to throw. Uh, I still qualified to be able to c- throw and compete in the Paralympics. But right. Uh, not in the sport that I was specialized in. Mm-hmm. So um, out of uh, 15 athletes, I uh, uh, made it to 14. <laughs> so I was ranked 14th in the world. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, so it was. That's a still a huge accomplishment. Yeah, man, huge accomplishment, you know? and uh, I was, v- you know, I was there, and right. Uh, uh, I n- I never qualified for another Paralympics. I I was very close to the London Paralympics. I missed my qualifying standards by very little, um, so I didn't qualify as an athlete. But uh, the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee still uh, gave me a huge honor, and they nominated me the U.S. Athlete Ambassador. So uh, I was able to still go to the 2012 London Paralympics, uh, uh, but basically kind of be the face, if you will, yeah. uh, of the athletes, uh, speak on behalf of the athlete body. Um, and uh, so I was able to go to a lot of like, uh, you know, dignitary dinners and mm-hmm. functions behind the scenes and uh, be to be able to experience the games from that perspective was really mind up you know blowing because yeah there's a lot more that goes into an event like that than right just i mean obviously you want to be an athlete and, and competing but it's yeah. like to yeah. be able to see the things that go on behind the curtain too that's a that's a unique experience that super unique. not every athlete you know gets the opportunity to right. do so right um it was um it was it was it was good it, it was a good time mm-hmm. um and uh i I have nothing but good things to say about the entire U.S. delegation, how it was treated, uh, and um, everything about that. It was yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, like, y- you also play wheelchair rugby, and you know how big, like, classification plays into that. And there's, yeah. 
like, I mean, for me, for example, like I made the U.S. team because I've always been on that borderline between a 0.5 and a 1. Mm -hmm. And my U.S. classification is always fluctuating. I still don't have my permanent um, just because every two, three years I either go up or I go back down or. um, But one year I got, you know, I was fortunate where I tried out as a 0.5 and got selected as a 0.5 to the U.S. team uh, in 2017. Mm -hmm. But at our first international competition which was at lakeshore um yeah i got i got classed up to a one and then it was just like that was kind of like my my death warrant yeah sense because it was just like oh shit and then it was like you know they took me to japan so i got to go travel with the team and and compete in japan but for parapans um they were like yeah we're not going to be able to take you and i was like dang because they're going to do another you know we could protest my class there um and then I actually just, I got back from Columbia last, I went to Columbia last year mm-hmm. um, to try to get reclassed before the, the Paralympic tryouts. And um, yeah, they said the same thing. They were just like, you know, you're just too strong for this class. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you do things that, you know, 0.5s aren't able to do. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. but, you know, you could tell them all you want. Like, well, there's ones that are doing things that yeah. I can't do. And it's yeah. like, well, they, you know, they never look at it like that. Right. Yeah. The similarities are are kind of shocking because it was basically the same excuse for my story. You know, they, they would say you're doing things as a 52 that no 52 can do, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, uh, it was kind of scary because my, we protested what I classified as when I got to China and they put me as a 54. Oh, so you went up two. I went up two two levels and 54s are basically all Paris. So, uh, that's a huge discrepancy because my throwing hand is my right side and my right side is my weak side. And I am in fact a quadriplegic, even, even though some may argue. Uh, so it was uh, a big deal and we protested and we won the protest and we went down to a 53. So I, I feel that I, I feel I am a 53. You mm-hmm. know? So it was just shocking at the moment because they changed my class at the Paralympics and, um, uh, I was just fortunate enough to still have standards in one of the throwing events, so they were able to just kind of throw me in that, yeah, uh, and um, and and compete. But uh, but th- uh, th- that basically changed my career as a professional athlete. It basically took me out of the ability to compete because those guys were throwing so much further than I was ever ever able to throw. Yeah. And in fact, I never threw qualifying standards for a 53 in the discus. It it it, it was basically like like you just said, it was my death warrant. Mm-hmm. You know, and um but uh that that was just kind of like the beginning of my sports career. I went on to play wheelchair basketball, I went on to play wheelchair yeah. rugby, you know, and um well, I was going to bring this up earlier, but yeah. that's uh you and I actually met at a um I think it was just. I think they just called it a introduction to Paralympic sport mm-hmm. at uh, Lakeshore. Mm-hmm. I want to say maybe 2011. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's that's when I was just on the drive up here. I was like, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 2000. I've known you for two, since 2011. Mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty sure it was early 2011. Um. But yeah, you you got me in the. You, you were running the the throwing portion. Yeah. And you got me up there, and I was just like tossing. I was just like, oh, this is cool at all. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have that gay inspiring moment <laughs> for me. <laughs> but also at that point, I was already kind of like balls deep in it with rugby. And, rugby, yeah. Um, yeah. But, man, the cool thing is like with throwing, it's like the numbers don't lie. So it's like you make the standard, you make the standard. Where, or you don't. Yeah, with, with like rugby, a lot of it can be subjective where it's like, you know, I could be the fastest in the mile and the fastest uh, full court sprint, which I'm not in either, but um, you know, there's, there's so many more components Mm -hmm. um, like how you get along with the team and how you, you know, what's your uh, sport IQ as far as the, you know, doing your, doing your job, you know, playing your role. Right. Um, Whereas throwing is just like, it's not a very attractive sport. Uh, I I really, I, I, not much to defend throwing about um it's uh, i think throwing it's it's uh it's um the, the, the joy or everything that i took out of throwing wasn't ac- the actual throwing part of it the, the throwing part of it is just 
what you do as a result of what I called the process, you know, which was your work in the gym, you mm-hmm. know. So th- I think for me, in my opinion, the sport of throwing, the joy of the sport is actually what you're doing in the gym. Yeah. You know, how you're taking care of your body, how you're recovering, uh, uh, doing all, all, all of the things that you got to do to then when you're ready to compete, you execute a throw. Um, that should be the easy part. That should be, you know, yeah. icing on the cake. But like the sport of throwing is what you're doing in the gym. Yeah. You know? And uh, and I really took a liking to that, you know. Yeah. Uh, that was me early on with my rugby. It was just like I like I enjoy playing the game and everything. And I love, you know, seeing the scoreboard and especially if we're on top. But like for me, it was like I loved getting up at. 6 a.m. Yeah. Being, being in the gym by 7:30, right, and doing those you know two hour sessions with just uh, my trainer, and then afterwards you know getting a, getting a quick bite, trying to eat clean, and then just going hit the either the cardio machines or just the weights, right um, on. or even just studying the game, right. But it was all the the behind the scenes stuff. That's um, yeah. So uh, what are you up to nowadays? Well. Um, I just graduated from Florida Atlantic University. I uh, graduated with a degree. Dude, I feel uh, like you've been in school forever. Yeah, I've been in school for five years. Yeah, the, the, the uh, electrical engineering uh, uh, program, it's, uh, you can do it in four or five years. Uh, I did it in five because I didn't want to really put on a heavy load. It's, uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, in my opinion, it's one of the harder engineering fields. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, after the Paralympics, after the 2012, I kind of took a couple years off. I was basically not doing anything, you know, and, and uh, I think the worst thing that could happen to anyone, able-bodied or not, you know, or in a wheelchair or not, I think the worst thing that could happen is if you get bored. And yeah. I got bored, man. I got really bored. Um, I, th- I, I think at that point I wasn't doing much um, – uh, sports. Um, I hadn't really gotten into rugby yet. Uh, uh, and I just didn't know what to do with myself. And, uh, I don't know who pushed me. Probably my mom. She was like, I want you to go to school, you know? And, uh, yeah. and, uh, I said, you know, I kind of brushed it off again and I, I went home, uh, that night and, uh, I think I woke up the next day and I was like, holy shit, man, I, I need to go to school, you know, uh, being in the military, you know, we have the GI Bill, and, and um, that's not forever. I mean, that expires if you don't use it. Does it does for, for guys like us, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They just changed it. They just changed so it, yeah. now they back, have it forever. But back then. Yeah, like, you had, I think you had like 10 or 15 years. 15 years, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I was kind of getting close to it, and I was like, you know, shame on e- e- Even if I, you know, study something that uh, I'm, I may not do in the future or, or, or something like that, um, I shouldn't allow such a – an amazing benefit to go to waste. Yeah. So I, I went to school. I, I started in uh, the fall of 2014 and I went straight. I didn't miss a semester or even a summer term since then. And I just graduated uh, um, the, um, this, this past fall, the fall of 2019. And uh, it's been uh, so rewarding to, uh, to, to, to really, uh, uh, go to school um, that's a huge accomplishment man. congratulations coming Thanks from a, him, yeah. a i don't know six-time college dropout yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge accomplishment i mean yeah. just not i mean take the wheelchair part of the equation but even just going to school and finishing it man like yeah. i you, i don't know i feel like the this kind of the society now like we kind of diminish like oh you're just some college kid like what the fuck do you know it's like well it's still like you know if if, if everyone could complete college and everyone would do it. Right. Um, right. But it's like, the, 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 you shouldn't ever let anyone take like that away from you. Cause it's like, that's that piece. It might just be a piece of paper, but that, you know, that represents all the nights that you stayed up, like, you know, till 2 AM writing yeah. papers and researching. Yeah. And yeah, there's, there's a reason why I'm bald, man. And <laughs> uh, there's uh yeah, it, it's, uh, um, I can't say that it was easy because by no means, I mean, there were times where I really wanted to uh, even, I don't think I would ever just go to the extreme and say I was going to drop out of school, but I, I did want to change majors. In fact, I did change majors once. Uh, I started out school um, as a physics major uh, and um, 
it it was uh, everything that I thought it was. You know, a lot of math, a lot of science, and I got a a, a job opportunity. I went to a uh, uh, like a job convention in Orlando, mm-hmm. and it was uh, it was put on by the SVA. I believe SVA stands for Student Veterans Association. I that believe sounds right. That's, that sounds, <laughs> sounds about right. And uh, basically, it's just a convention where a lot of schools and a lot of uh, 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 job opportunity, you know, a lot of companies are out there recruiting veterans. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was able to interview with a company there. Uh, it was a defense contractor. And um, uh, the gentleman, the recruiter said, Carlos, you're a, a fantastic candidate for a position that we have. Uh, but there's a problem. And it's you're a physics major. And uh, he basically was very blunt and forward with me and says, no one's hiring a physics major. I mean, if you have a PhD in thermodynamics, then sure, you can get a job somewhere. But if you get a bachelor's of science in physics, you're going to be a middle school math teacher, bro. You're, you're, it's not a very, you know, <laughs> we can't really do No offense to any middle school physics yeah. teachers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no offense to any uh, math middle school teachers, but... Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, he basically advised me to close my eyes and pick any engineering field. And I would be a perfect candidate for uh, basically any engineering job. And, uh, you know, I, I said thank you. I, I, I never really was interested in working for that company, but uh, I was grateful for the opportunity to interview and kind of learn that process. And uh, I I really took what he said to, to heart and to mind and um, I came to my own realization that in fact he, he was right and uh, I went to my, my school advisor and uh, I asked you know what engineering field would translate the courses that I had taken already for physics and because you, you, you know you don't want to lose credit hours you don't want to retake classes yeah you don't want to lose time and money in something that you already done and and it turns out that I could have picked any field and all of the physics courses that I've taken translated perfectly. Oh, so, that's great. So then I could have just picked anything that I wanted. And uh, I was always, uh, 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 I always enjoyed mathematics. And I, so then I, I you know, kind of use that as a, uh, 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 you know, kind of gauge which engineering field. And it, I guess I selected electrical engineering. And uh, uh, that's, that's what I graduated with. And uh, it's just... It's kind of surreal. I mean, I I graduated so recent, re- so recent ago that I still don't even have the diploma. They haven't, because if not, it'd be uh, I'd put it up somewhere around here. But yeah. I haven't. They haven't mailed it yet. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So that, that uh, I'm very excited to get that in. And uh, I mean, you're right. You said it, it really is just a piece of paper. But you know, it took a lot of a lot of hard work to earn that piece of paper, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just like when you work. when you graduate boot camp and they give you that eagle globe and anchor, and you're just yeah. like. This is just a three dollar piece of metal. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it like it represents yeah. Everything that you just went through and, and it kind of it puts you in, in the club and mm-hmm. I don't know if there's like a club for diplomas because I don't yeah. have one. But like <laughs> yeah. uh yeah. No, I, like you know, you said like with the GI Bill, like it was kind of important for you to use that mm-hmm. and like I I feel the same way and just with my path, I was just like there's no degree where I feel like I need like I, I I'd be able to use it. You know, at first I thought maybe creative writing, but there's so much, it's so hard to be a, a writer and there's just so much work. And I was just like, I'm not that passionate about writing, mm-hmm. but you know, when I went back to school the fourth time, I, yeah. I took a, I did a, um, like a certificate program for multimedia journalism. It was just a three tr- trimester course, um, not course, but like pipeline and so when I did that, you know, I, I did like video editing classes and like some journalism work for the school newspaper. And I was like, I'm really interested in that. Mm-hmm. So I got about two years left on mine. So I might go back and do some like audio engineering um, certificates. Awesome. And then maybe just continue with just, just taking, not necessarily like pursuing a degree, but just taking classes that I think might help, especially with the podcast. Like if I can do maybe some more Photoshop classes, uh, even like the, you know, learn how to use audition and maybe even just a more of an advanced video editing class too, I think would be helpful. And those are all things that I, I enjoy doing, Mm -hmm. not necessarily degree seeking, but it's like, I feel, I feel like I'd be letting everyone 
down. Like I'd be letting all the veterans down, especially the ones, you know, that never made it to their DD two fourteen. Right. Um, that like, dude, you have this, this gift is yeah. the best benefit. You know, it's your, it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's like a golden ticket for people from the lower class to jump up into the middle class is how I've right. always looked at the GI bill. It's like, it's a free, free ticket to not a free ticket, but right. it's, you know, your ticket to an education, um, and you're able to jump up, you know, those class. Uh, so I feel like if I, if I just let it go to waste and let it expire, it's like, mm. you're just letting everyone down. Right. Um, so yeah, I got, I got four years to figure my shit out, but yeah. Uh, there's a lot of cool technical schools out there, man, that are, you know, and, and we're really lucky in this area. There's a lot of universities and a lot of uh, colleges and, and uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of like two year programs out there where like, I mean, if you want to become a, I don't know, a welder, you know, you can yeah. get a degree in welding, you know, and, and you can do that. Uh, but there's a, a school where you hear that has a degree in, in um, you know, like productions, you know, like, yep. you know, so then there's a portion of it where it's editing and there's a portion of it where you're like a, like you said, a sound engineer or you're a stage engineer and things like that. Um, and uh, you can use your GI Bill for, for those things. I mean, if you want to become a, if you want to go to a school, there's a school down the road called Lynn University. It's a private university and they, they specialize in aeronautic degrees, you know. So if you want to become yeah. a pilot, you can use your GI Bill to become a pilot. So then like, uh, uh, it's just, uh, you just got to find out you know, if they take the, the GI Bill, and there's a, there's a lot of schools out there to for, for our viewers. Uh, you know, if if a school is qualified a yellow ribbon school, they won't they won't charge you anything. You just need to be a veteran. Yeah. You know, and and that's huge. You know, um, you just kind of got to do your due diligence and um, you know, make a couple calls and just kind of get the ball rolling. I was not a standout student. I in fact I was a terrible student in high school. You know. In fact, I was such a terrible student in high school that I couldn't even play soccer because my GPA sucked. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So then, like, it was such a letdown. I feel I felt like I let some so many people down, you know, uh, uh, myself included. You know, I, I couldn't believe that um, that uh, that I was the cause of me not be able be, be, be able to pursue athletics uh, in high school. Um, and uh, so then, I never ever thought that I would get a college education. Uh, let alone an engineering uh, with an engineering degree. And uh, basically it's just, you know, uh, 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 the hard work, you know, and uh, you just got to put in a little work in the beginning, get your, get your information, uh, get everything kind of laid out and then really sit down and, and think about what you want to do. Uh, when it comes to a lot of things in life, you, sometimes you don't have to have a, a degree a university degree you know you, there's a lot of cool online courses that you can take yeah you can oh get yeah a certificate and uh, you can and a lot of places will accept that certificate as you know you've mm -hmm. been qualified for that position and then you can you can go on from there so then just uh there's a lot of options out there man i think a lot of it too has to do like if you're ready you know it's like because i feel like when we make kids kind of decide what they're going to be for the rest of their life while they're still in high school yeah. and they, they've only ever experienced, you know, their hometown, they might've gone a state over and right. then it's like, you know, here, pick a career and yeah. go, go get after it, young man. And it's yeah. like, I feel like you just need a little bit of more life experience and yeah. just to see what else is out there before you, right. you make that like decision, make that commitment. Cause mm -hmm. it's like, if you're not, if you're not a hundred percent in it, like you're just setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. And then even if you do succeed with it, it's like, are you, are you ultimately happy? Right. You know? Yeah. I think that's a benefit of also of, uh, uh, spending some time in the military, you know, um, y you know, if, if we want to or not, we're going to get deployed or we're going to get, you know, what if your duty, what if your first duty station is in Germany or something, you know, yeah. you have to travel the world, you know, and, and be exposed to, you know, you're going to meet people, not just in your field, you're going to meet people, you're going to make friends that have other jobs in the military. Yeah. And, and you're going to be exposed to other things. So then, when you when you get out after four years or after eight years or whatever, um, you may have a broader idea of what you want to do. Whereas if you've never left your county ever in your life, yeah, you know, it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, like it's it's uh, that's a hard hard thing to think about. Yeah, so no, it is. We, have, we definitely have a uh, an advantage when it comes to that. Yeah, I mean that's the first time I ever 
heard of anyone wanting to go and becoming like a writer was it's either in boot camp or in SOI in infantry school. But yeah, was, I think my rack mate was just like, yeah, you know, after all this is done, I'm going to go back to school and study writing. I was like, fuck, you <laughs> study writing? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? You just write, right? <laughs> but mm-hmm. yeah, he's just like, no, dude, like you can make a living becoming a writer for a newspaper or write your own books. I was just like, the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's just, uh, I brought this up so many times uh, on the podcast, but it's like growing up in an Asian household, I'm limited. Like I could either have been a doctor, I could have <laughs> been a lawyer or an engineer. Yeah. And I didn't want to do any of those. So it was just like, I've always button heads with my mom or a business major was a big one. And that's what I thought for a while. I was just like, all right, I'm just going to go through the motions, go to school, become a business guy. And I did a, uh, uh, kind of like a unpaid internship. It was more like a job shadow mm-hmm. with this uh, marketing company. And I was just like, this isn't for me. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be in an office. I want, yeah. I want a job where I'm going to be working outside and stuff. So um, ultimately, like, I, I got a pretty good gig working on heavy machinery uh, as a mechanic uh, for Caterpillar. And then I just, I've, I had always been kind of drawn to the military. And I was just like, you know, coming from, also coming from an immigrant family, it was just like, you know, we're in this country, but like, I don't ever get treated like I'm from America, from right. other Americans, because I'm always going to be that son of the immigrant. But it's like, you know, if I go join the military, nobody can ever say shit to me, right? Ever again, you know, right? It's like, well, what have you done for it? Yeah. You know? So that's that was my big motivation was, um, you know, just going in and just it wasn't even. I didn't even really think much of it. I was just like, I'm just going to go join. It's four years. Like, right. what's four years? Because right. now it's just like four years ain't shit. Right. Like, oh, yeah. Time flies, man. It does. It the, does. Um, what um, what uh, are you doing as far as, like, athletics? Um, like, just keeping in shape? Or? Well, uh, nowadays, uh, unfortunately, I've, you know, kind of been uh, dealing with some uh, health issues uh, with some herniated disc in my lower back and uh and uh, just uh kind of dealing with that and you think that's from just throwing I, or you know i really think it, it it was from throwing um you know when when you're a seated thrower you kind of you kind of sit in like this bar stool looking thing mm-hmm. that's strap exactly what tight. it is yeah it's just a bar stool it's basically a bar stool yeah and you rotate around the lower spine to kind of get the implement out and um you know i did it um for you know, uh, a, a little while, and I, I, I think it may have kind of accelerated. I think it was going to happen eventually, but uh, you know, because being in the in the military and y- you know having to, you know, hair uh, wear heavy equi- also equipment. Also, jumping, yeah. jumping can't be good on the back. Yeah, either. jumping or the know, landing. I guess the jumping's fine. The landing can't be the good. The landing, yeah, yeah. And I've had some uh, some uh, pretty rough. I mean, if we had more time, we can tell some. Oh, we got all the time you want, man. We got some gruesome stories uh, where, you know, and we'll we'll go into it in a little bit where, um, you know, you may uh, miss the the jump zone, you know, where you might miss where you're supposed to land. And in Hawaii, where we uh, where we were jumping, it's a lot. I mean, you're jumping into the mountains, you know, they have this this little airfield, you know, this little LZ. And if you don't if, if, if the pilots don't let you go exactly when you're when you're supposed to or when the jump masters don't calculate the winds exactly yeah. right you may jump into a mountain range yeah you know well because isn't it like every second up there translates to like i don't know what like 500 uh feet or meters right on the on the on, on the, the surface on the surface on the ground yeah, yeah. so it, uh, I, I don't exactly remember the exact conversions but you have the right idea you know um where if uh, if if the winds aren't what they uh, uh, calculated them to be, or if they change, like let's say the winds, and it's very common where, you know, the winds may be, you know, below thirteen knots, you know, and th- so then you're clear to jump, but then as soon as as soon as the the, the 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 team is in the air, all of a sudden it picks up to like thirty knots or twenty five knots, it's gonna skew the the calculations, and you're gonna miss completely by by hundreds of feet. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, right. That's a serious problem, you know. Uh, So, um, you know, I've had really rough landings, man. I'm talking like sack of potatoes, you know. (laughs) And then you hit the ground, and if if 
if the if the ground wind is anything above you know you know 15 feet uh or 15 knots you know you're gonna go for a ride because the parachute's not gonna deflate it's gonna stay inflated and the wind is just gonna, oh, it's just gonna, it's gonna drag you damn you know? so then so then you, you you you're connected to the parachute with your risers and when there's that much tension on the risers you can't pop them you, you're not going to be able to rip them out yeah so you're just going to go for a ride until the wind dies down you know but <laughs> you know we're talking rocks bushes grass just gravel getting thrashed. you're getting ripped up man all while you're carrying a bunch of other heavy stuff exactly. and a rifle yeah yeah exactly so it's a uh, so you can you can you know so and i i guess my body's kind of been through a little bit but i you know you're a you're a 20 nothing year old stud you know you're gonna yeah. brush that off and you're fine but you know after years and years of doing that it kind of it kind of uh, uh accumulates and eventually your body's gonna give and you ever get stuck in a tree i've been <laughs> stuck i have dude yes i've been stuck in a tree i've been stuck twice i can think of two times that i was stuck in a tree um and uh, one was uh, one wasn't too too bad because I was the, the parachute was entangled in the tree, but I was still on the ground. So oh, okay, <laughs> so that 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 wasn't too too bad. But there was one case where I was up in a tree. You know, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah, how it, how far do you think you were from the deck? From the deck, I was probably like, you know, twenty feet. Yeah, you know, and and and, and that's not bad, you know. Uh, so what's the protocol? You know, like how would I get myself down? You know, if 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 I'm really high, you don't. You sit still. You kind of wait until your the 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 ground team kind of finds you, and then you kind of see what the best <laughs> what the how how best to handle that situation. Um, uh, typically, what you would do is um, depending on how high you were jumping, you know, you would pack a reserve parachute. You know. So then what you would do then is you would pop the reserve parachute and you would allow that parachute to fall to the ground. And then you would kind of like very carefully undo your harness and then you just climb, you kind of like climb down the parachute. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, right. So then, okay. uh, so then that's, that, that's best case scenario. Like if you're not that high up, yeah. uh, if you are way up there, you know, and of course we were jumping in Hawaii where, uh, like I s mentioned earlier, we're in a mountain range. You know, so if you miss the LZ and you're like on the edge of the mountain, there's a hundred foot valley. You know, so if you're like on one of those high trees that's kind of like off into the valley, yeah, you can be hundreds of feet up. How the hell are we gonna get to you? You know, uh, and and in those cases, it's uh, it becomes a huge operation. Um, and basically, you climb down the tree. You know, but uh, I mean if. But then that gets complicated. What if the guy has a severe injury? What if the guy broken limbs? Yeah. And th then it becomes a very, very big operation. I was never a part of anything like that. But uh, we w we did have one night that I remember um, uh, like it was yesterday where uh, basically the entire jump stick went off the LZ and they went into the valley. And uh, it basically took all night to find all the guys because you guys are just all scattered because we were all scattered. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was uh, I didn't jump that night, but I was a part of like the recovery team. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was out one of the riggers on the ground and uh, it was just one of those flukes. You know, um, I think it that night it was that the pilot released us too early, you know, so the guys that actually did the jump that night. um they were never even close, you know. Like, if you if if you jump late, that's one thing. You have a chance. You have a a small chance of still making it to the LZ if you're a good parachutist in the air and you know how to kind of glide in. But if you if you're jumped if you're released early, you'll you'll never make it, you know, because when you jump out of an airplane, you're jumping with the wind, right? Yeah. So then when you jump out of the back of the uh, aircraft, the wind is to your back. So then, if you have six people jumping. You know the f the 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 first three will, you know, will go, and by the time that the last person goes, the first three will try to kind of turn their parachutes mm. against the wind, 
and ideally everyone should turn their parachute against the wind to kind of naturally slow you down yeah so that your descent by the time that you hit land is you're not going really fast yeah so basically like in a real world operation you know the the guys in the front will turn their parachutes they'll kind of coast back in and then the guys that were jumped later everyone kind of everyone kind of meets meets in the center yeah. right but if <laughs> but if you're released early there's no chance you know you're you're never going to make it um, yeah, so I think that that, that night it was. Uh, I guess they found that the 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 pilot let everyone go early, and it was just a mess, man. It, it, yeah. I think one of the guys uh, ended up like spraining his ankle, like oh, being shit. hung up on the tree or whatever, and it took it took him a little while to to get him down. But uh, yeah, it took about all night to find all the guys. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it sucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But especially like just yeah, at, like at night because you're just like. Yeah, but and it's, it's colder, it's yeah, dark, and you're it's, just like yeah, it was a mess, man. Uh, most jump operations are at night. Most jumping is mm-hmm. like, you'll do some day stuff, you know, for for reps for practice. Yeah, you know? uh, but uh, most of our jumps were are are, are at night, and uh, and uh, you know the real fun ones were when you would do a night jump into the water. All uh, right, like a water jump, man. Those are are crazy looking because, um, y- you know, when you're jumping at night, you know. When you're way up, you can still see kind of like the city lights, you know, way out in the horizon. But then when you're looking down, when you're coming down, you kind of like see different shades of black, you know. It's yeah. Really everything. Uh, it's not until you're really getting close to where you start seeing contrast and you start seeing, the, you know, what what is what. Like, oh, yeah, those are trees. Uh, and yeah. This is grass, you know. But when you're doing a water jump, it's just black, you know. It's, you, you know, you come out of the air you come out of the bird and, and you just see black, you know, and, uh, so that is, really and you're not using any night vision or anything. No, no, not when you jump. Yeah. Yeah. At least our unit didn't, you uh-huh. know, I, who knows what other units do. Um, but, uh, no, uh, we use chem lights, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. When we're in the water, crap, we're going to chem light, you know, and then that's how we, you know, uh, because there'll always be like boats in the water and stuff like that. So then we'll be able to find the guys in the water, right. chem lights and whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, so um, but you know, you just kind of go with it, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. I d- I just I never thought it would like uh, it's such a coordinated effort uh, yeah. between like the pilots and the ground crew, and then just everything that you're doing, and it's like making sure everything just stays on point. It's amazing that you're even able to pull that off. I never thought about it like the logistics of it, you mm-hmm. know, um, because you you just you do exactly what you were trained to do yeah and just that you know yeah a, 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 as you put you're just one cog in the wheel basically like you're not worried about what what the other cogs are doing as long as they're doing it as long as they're doing it yeah, yeah. so uh, especially a, as a rigger you know you you have a very important job to do you know you're taking right. care of people's parachutes you know if you do your job incorrectly someone dies that's why i was curious with like how the the recon guys kind of took you in because i feel like if they were st- i feel i mean if i was in that position i'd I'd be like, hey man, you need anything? Like, yeah, you need some dip or some beer? Right, right. Like, I'm gonna take care of you because, yeah, because yeah. uh, I'm in about you know a couple minutes, I'm gonna be jumping out of this plane. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we always had like, you know, jokes and stuff like that, and and you hit it right on. You know, like they were always, while they still kind of, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as as far as saying hazing or anything like that. That was a really popular word when when I was in. You know, uh, it probably was when when you were in and. Uh, I would I would never go as far as saying that, but uh, you know they always gave the riggers uh, uh, a hard time because they're not quite recon guys, you know. Uh, and um, uh, uh, but I did pack your parachute, you know. So, right. so, so there was like a you know a, a, a really interesting dynamic there, and uh, uh, you know whenever a guy would kind of step over or kind of went a little too far with him being high and mighty. You know, Joey Recon or Re- uh, Ricky Recon. Ricky uh, Recon. R- Ricky was Recon. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, it like, listen here, motherfucker. When you jump to Mike, this is your parachute. You know, like, I, 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 you know. Uh, so then it would, um, it, it would, it, and, you know, like, as riggers, you know, you can, depending on how you pack the chute, you can make it to where the parachute opens a little earlier or a little later. Yeah. So you can kind of scare the guys a little bit, you know, or, you know, or, or, or you know, the, 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 the pool can be a little harder when you know most of the jumps that we did were static line jumps you know and uh, which so that means that 
there's a 15 foot cord that's attached to your parachute. So, but so when you jump out, the parachute gets pulled for you. Mm -hmm. You can rig it in a way to where that's a little more jolting, you know, so you can scare the shit out of a guy that's been giving you too much. You know, yeah. Lip, you know, uh, and, uh, but no, for the most part, everyone was always really, 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 uh, uh, you know, good to the rigors, you know? So we always got free beer and stuff and, and, uh, especially when the, when the guys would have a good jump, you yeah. know, they, they would take care of the rigors, but, uh, yeah, it was always an interesting dynamic between, you know, uh, you know, people that are actual quote unquote war fighters and people that are, are not, you know? Uh, so again, that's why I said my job was a really unique position where i was kind of somewhere stuck right in the middle right you know and, and uh again my job was so unique you know it's it's just a a weird thing you know hey what'd you do today ah, i jumped out of a plane you know a couple times you know yeah you know and our paraloft a paraloft is basically the hangar quote unquote you know bodega okay where you kind of store all the equipment and we have our packing table like a stuff. dive locker basically or, yeah. exactly like a dive do yeah. locker but for parachutes or an armory, I guess, but same yeah. difference. Yep. And, uh, ours was literally on a beach in Hawaii. It was on a beach. So yeah. for, for, you know, if we didn't want to go to the hall for, for lunch break, you know, we'd get on our boogie. I, I was a terrible surfer. I tried surfing once and I almost drowned. It was horrible. Yeah. I was not a good surfer. Uh, but, uh, I could lay on a board and let the wave take me. So I, you know, um, we really enjoyed uh, a, a boogie boarding or body boarding. Yeah. So for lunch, sometimes we would skip cha and we'd just go to the water. Yeah. You know, we'd be in the water for a couple hours or an hour and a half, and then we'd go back to the paraloft, pack a few more parachutes, and call it a day. Nice. You know, so it was a really weird, it was just really weird to be in the f Fleet Marine Corps, but not. You yeah, know, it was just you were a, just kind of like on your, you're just OFP, kind of just doing your own thing. We were doing our own thing. Yeah. We were far removed from the base. I mean, we were on the base, but, <laughs> you know, not, it just felt like we weren't in garrison. We were just like in this building off on the, you know, literally on a beach. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, did you ever do any like snorkeling or anything, uh, diving? We did. We did. I did a lot of snorkeling while we were in Hawaii. Um, again, it was just because of where I was stationed, you know, mm -hmm. it was just a, luck of the draw that I got sent there, but, uh, it was a good pastime for us. You know, have you done that since your accident? I have, man. I yeah. have. Um, Are you scuba certified? I'm not, but I want to dude. Let's get you on it. Yeah. I, I want to, I ran into, um, w one of our, one of our mutual friends, um, Larry Porter. Oh yeah. Shout he, out to Larry. He's yeah, the one that got me kind of into it too. Right on, yeah. Life waters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he kind of, you know, I ran into him a couple years ago or, last year at the uh disney marathon oh yeah yeah, yeah he, he does he does loves doing all that yeah, stuff yeah yeah um i you know my my girlfriend did the uh the, the i think the 10k that you know mm -hmm. he was doing the uh the dopey i think which that is, so so the dopey is one of the one of the uh, dwarfs from the snow white and the seven dwarfs so the way disney does it is that they have like <clears throat> their races after one of the characters of yeah. One of the Disney characters. And the Dopey is basically, and it, it'll make sense why it's called the Dopey. On Thursday, you'll do the 5K. On Friday, you'll do the 10K. On Saturday, you'll do the half marathon. And on Sunday, you'll do the fa full marathon. So that's why you do the four races in four days, and it's called the Dopey, um, which is really neat because you'll get the medal for all individual marathon or yeah. races but then you'll get a, a special medal to say that you completed the okay dopey. um for someone in a chair is still a huge accomplishment but could you imagine to, for an actual runner that's that's a well i guess equal accomplishment but but i'm uh, trying to do the math it's like two marathons cl close -ish. So ish yeah close yeah. yeah it's yeah about two marathons yeah i could probably do it you can definitely do it I don't know that last. Day. I so I did the um I did the A one A marathon yesterday, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and I wish it was my second marathon. The first uh -huh. marathon nailed the training on point. Everything yeah. felt great. Second this this marathon I just I didn't have the time oh, to man. do anything. So it was like I I played rugby. You know I played yeah. I had the tournament in Jacksonville earlier this month, and I was just like. I don't know if I'm gonna be ready, but I was yeah. like, "Fuck, I'm already registered. I already got yeah. the hotel. Yeah, I'm not gonna get my money back on any of that. So no. you might as well just get the fuck out there and just do it." Man. How was the wind when you're running? Uh, when you're going across the, you know, you know not terrible. Okay. Um, 
it, it was, you know, the start time was for the wheelchair um, uh, participants. It was 545 was our start time. Right on. So it was st- still dark and it was mm-hmm. cold. It was cold until the last like hour, hour and a half of the race. Mm-hmm. The wind wasn't terrible. It, yeah. A lot of the people I was talking with uh, at the finish line was just telling me, like, this is probably the best weather that we've had for this particular race. It's usually cold. Is but it? what was awesome, man, it's just a flat course. Yeah. There was yeah. one bridge crossing. Uh-huh. Um, and that was a motherfucker. That was, yeah. like, <laughs> two miles in. I was just like, yeah. I thought this was supposed to be flat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going up it just. Yeah. I mean, one push at a time. Everybody's passing me. Right. Did you use your rugby chair or your oh, uh, actual racing chair? Rugby chair. Oh, yeah. Rugby I don't. Chair. I don't have oh. a racing chair. Okay. Um, yeah. I've uh, I've only done the my two marathons and my two half marathons in a rugby chair because yeah. I feel like using a hand cycle is just like it's almost cheating. You like, know, y- 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 that's the that's what you think. You know, but my first couple marathons, well, yeah. actually, in hindsight, all of the marathons that I've ever done. We're in hand cycles. Yeah. And it's still like an accomplishment. And it's yeah. cool. Like, yeah. I, I've kind of, I used to dog on guys that Did it? would do yeah. it. Yeah. Because don't hold it in the same pedestal as, no. like, a run a person running a marathon. Yeah. It, it's still an accomplishment. And what, what really kind of made me change my views on it was just like, well, at least you're getting out and doing something. Yeah. Man. You know, versus, and it's also cool to, you know, they shut down parts of the city and mm-hmm. you get to go up and down. So, like, yeah. I don't, I don't really... I don't really hate that much anymore. No, I, you know, I, I never really took it as, um, cause I knew going in, it's like, ah, oh, you know, some of the guys are going to give me shit for doing it on a hand cycle, you know, but I never really did it to compete. I did it to kind of go with my buddies and yeah. let's go for a cool push. Right. Know? So I've done several marathons in my hand cycle, but we, we don't do it to compete. We just went to have fun, you know, yeah. uh, we'd probably go out drinking the whole night before that. Yeah. And so we'd, kind of pull an all-nighter and just show up to the racing line yeah. you know some of the guys piss themselves before the race you know, i mean it's, so it's gonna happen yeah. <laughs> it's gonna happen you know so and you just kind of uh it, you know we did it for for a good time but uh but uh you know at, at least we're out there you know yeah you think about ever doing any more of that stuff? I, I think so yeah um i have the you know a rugby chair er, and uh, all, all the all, all the sports equipment and uh so i'm thinking about you know, once yeah. I kind of recover from what, what I'm dealing with, um, I kind of still want to get back into, uh, uh, you know, ac- active athletics. Yeah, because there's, uh, I was looking at the race calendars for just this area of Florida. It's just like, even just South Florida, there's yeah. so many races. It's so like every week there's one thing going on. It's yeah. like, and it's a good way to stay active and just keep yourself. Absolutely. You know, um, that's due to the nature of where we live too. You know, the weather kind of, we don't really have a winter. Mm-hmm. You know, so, uh, you know, it, it, we may get some rain, you know, half the year or yeah. the quarter of the year. Uh, but for the most part, like the race season is year round, you know. So, um, you know, like you did the A1A, you know, I think the week next week would probably be Miami because it's usually like one I or think two that, weeks yeah, apart. Yeah, someone had know? asked me if I was doing Miami. Yeah, exactly. Like, no. Yeah. So it's uh, and then, you know, and there's so many different types of races. And that's just if you think about marathons you know if you think about triathlons i got into doing triathlons for for a few seasons oh yeah uh, i loved it you know um uh, so then uh, and then there's also like duathlons that they do a lot you know so then you or even just ultras even just ultras too you know for for those that don't know ultras is just like two marathons you know or sometimes i think it's just technically anything over 26.2 okay yeah yeah uh and they have them here in florida you know and a Mm -hmm. lot of people like coming to to florida to do those races because yeah. of the nature of the uh, of the topography you know like yeah most races are all flat right you know um the miami marathon kind of is not as flat because you go over a, b- a few bridges uh, yeah s- a few times and wh- i think I, I don't know like sometimes you, you got to go up the rickenbacker causeway and it looks that like it sounds like daunting dude it's ho- <laughs> yeah and i think i did that you know, my first year doing the Miami Marathon, I wasn't prepared for it, mm. and I almost couldn't make it up. Like I, uh, you know, I threw my hand cycle into like the lowest gear, yeah, uh, and I, I still barely made it up the the causeway. And uh, you know, it, it's just one of those things. It was so, it was such an accomplishment, man. You know, so then after that, you know, I didn't care about the other race. I just was so 
you know, elated that I was able to get up that damn bridge. Yeah. You know, um, and oh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to, and this was only two miles into my race. I was like, <laughs> I, I better just take it slow. Cause if I yeah. burn myself out, right. like it's going right. to be another yeah. 24 miles of yeah. hell. Um, so I just took it pretty slow, pretty, pretty steady. Slow. Right on. There's um, a good race in uh, the Orlando area. It's called the Melbourne marathon. Mm-hmm. And there are two causeways. It's basically like a big square. You know? Yeah. So you're like in mainland and then you go up a bridge and then you're like on this island and then you go down and then you go back up a bridge oh. and you do that twice. So oh. you got to do you got to do the bridges four times. Yeah. And it they are huge causeways, you know. So it is you know uh, uh at least for us quads, it is brutal. You know, um and uh so it, you know it's 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 weird because yeah. you think it's all flat but you can challenge yourself and find good races where you can yeah. have some hills and or in this case bridges but uh yeah man it's when uh when I was so I'm getting a hand cycle here pretty soon mm-hmm. um cuz there's a uh, it, it's a Seattle to Portland bike ride and they shut down the the freeways it's a 2-day bike ride it's like 202 miles mm-hmm. um so I'm getting a hand cycle for that um but when I was driving out to Key West I was noticing the bike path and I was just like, dude, how cool would it be to drive from mainland U.S. all the way up to Florida? And I think it's like something like 100 miles, some change. Mm-hmm. But fuck, that would be so dope. Yeah, there's um, a really famous bike ride. Uh, it, it, it's, it's 100 mi- I think it's like a 100-mile bike ride. Uh, and they do it here uh, once a year. And it's basically they start in Homestead mm-hmm. and they go all the way to Key West. Okay. You know, and it's it's pretty amazing because it's – a hundred miles. It's more than a hundred miles. Yeah. Actually, you know, so, um, uh, th- those bike rides, uh, I never really did anything like that. I always, it was always in the back of my mind, but I never got around to it. But, uh, you know, they have a really cool race where it, when you were going down to Key West, you, you went over the seven mile bridge. Oh yeah. Well, there's a very famous seven mile bridge run and it's a race that you do it all on the bridge. Oh wow. So it's the seven mile bridge run. And, uh, usually that that race is sold out within minutes each year. So then, like, every year that they have it, it'll uh, – the tickets for the next year will go on sale just after the race, mm-hmm. and they'll sell out again in minutes. That's just awesome. Cause, just because of the nature. You can imagine you have the Gulf on one side and you have the Atlantic on the other. I mean, it's just be- – it's a yeah. beautiful race. Um, I've never done it, um, but like I told you, uh, Key West is one of my favorite places in the country. And uh, Oh, dude, yeah. it's – it's definitely my favorite place in Florida. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big Florida guy. Like I, I right. like it. It's good for the honeymoon period. Sure. It's not for everybody. Not for everyone. It's. I mean, what you got here is just. It's. It's gorgeous, but it's just like. It's not. It's not a kept secret anymore. Everybody no. knows about it. So yeah, there's just so many people yeah. now. But yeah, there is something really yeah. cool, and it's, I think it's probably because it's just an island. So you get kind of like that, like a, almost a Hawaiian vibe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love it, man. It's, yeah. Uh, if I'm thinking, I'm gonna look into that that uh, hundred miler out to Key West. Yeah. Um, do you know what time of year it usually is? Um, I I don't, but I could definitely find that information for you. Yeah, that worried. sounds. Yeah. Because r- like right now, I mean, with my rugby stuff, it's just like I'm, I, I I'm I could still be competitive as a one. I probably might even still be able to make the team as a one once some of the veteran ones start retiring. Mm-hmm. But it's like, do I really want to put in another four years? Right. Because, um, like, I mean, I'm 32 now, and it's like, those are years that I could be doing other things. And it's not, it's, it wasn't always about making it to the Paralympics and competing for, the, like, the medal. And it was more just self-challenges. Right. And that's that's why I started doing these, like, marathons. And um, I'm just always looking for different ways, like, just challenge what I yeah. what you think is capable. And just saying, yeah. all right, here, hold Hold my beer. Like, yeah, yes, you know. it's exactly, exactly. Um, there's a lot of cool uh, events like that all across the country. Um, there's that famous Redwoods race up by your neck of the woods, where it's like a, it, it's um, it's the race is done over a, a, a week long period. Oh shit! And it's it's a, a few hundred miles, and you cover like sixty or seventy miles a day. That's so and insane. It's brutal, and if you don't keep pace, you know you can get each day. There's cutoff times, you know. And, yeah. And uh, so things like that, you know, like you can find things, uh, and it it takes a unique type of person, a, a unique type of personality that can take on those challenges. Um, 
And even if, you know, for, for, for the people out there listening, you know, like you do not have to be an elite athlete. You know, you don't have to have a bike that costs ten thousand dollars. You know, um, I mean, you did. Did you do the full marathon? Just yesterday. Just yesterday. The oh yeah. Full. Okay, you yeah. did an entire marathon in a rugby chair. Yeah, that's crazy. Without any training. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, you know. So and that, I mean, that just goes to show that. I mean, if you're if you're uh, someone out there that is a, a wheelchair user. You don't have to have any specialized equipment. You can go out and do the 5K in your wheelchair. Yeah. yeah. I actually had this kind of, it was almost like a dream, but I, I kind of had this vision where it was like, what if I show up on race day and all three of my wheels, my two wheels and my spare are flat? You know, I'm with my mom. And she's not going to be able to fix it in time. So I was like, I was thinking like, I wonder if I could do it in my everyday. <laughs> Yeah. So I think I might try. I might start with a 5K. You might, yeah. And every day, and then yeah. maybe work up to a, a half. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to do a full. Yeah, that's but, that's heavy. But I think I think I can do a a, a half in every day. Mm -hmm. So that might be my next. If I um, we've been doing the the Vegas marathon. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did the the Vegas half in 2012, and then we just did it again last year with a couple of the the militia um guys and gals um because kara did it with us uh but yeah i was just like it's kind of been our thing we dress up as like mario kart characters awesome so yeah. if you want to get in on it man we just we were in our rugby chairs yeah it's, i'll get in on that man it's in november okay so i might get in on that that's that sounds like fun yeah. you know? well it's cool what's really cool about the vegas one is they uh it's at night mm -hmm. and they shut down the strip and it, it's the only the they shut down the strip twice a year mm -hmm. for new year's eve and then for the marathon wow um so you're running up and down the strip at night so it's pretty dope that's um, awesome yeah, yeah. I, I might have to get in on that we'll talk about that uh after hours yeah and, uh, that'd be that'd be awesome because yeah, i'm always it, it, we only did it It was uh me and kara and josh birch which mm -hmm. the, those are two new guys that you mm -hmm. probably haven't met yet Not yet yeah you haven't been around man no i haven't been around I miss you uh, i know i miss you guys too you know it's uh but s sometimes you gotta have those small sacrifices. Yeah. For, you know, but now that you're done with school, done with just school, gotta get the health back up. Gotta get my health back up, and uh, you know, I, I'm not really worried about finding a position uh, uh, just yet. Um, I would love to contribute somewhere at some point. I have really cool ideas as to how I wanna, um, you know, where where I would like to work. And uh, uh, but for now, it's just really about taking care of myself, yeah. spending time with my girlfriend, my right. family, you know. Uh, and uh, and then we'll go from there. But uh, yeah, man, it's y any time that I can uh, spend with the people that I love being around, doing the things that I love doing. Yeah, it's, it's that's a life worth living, man. You know, and right? And that's that's, that's really what it's all. About. I've I've found that out that it's just like that's you know it's not all about just chasing the the money or anything because no. that's not what's going to be ultimately what makes you happy. You're, no. you're never going to think about. You know, when you're an 80 year old man, you're not going to think about, oh, remember that time I put in that 60 hour work week and I made 15 G's? No. <laughs> you're, you're never, you're going to be like, never. no, remember that time that like me and Carlos went out to Colombia in yeah. 2016? And, yeah. You know, shit like that. And it's exactly. like, exactly. so I want to get you back with Oscar Mike. I think uh, a good event would be um, we do an annual skydiving event yeah. up in um, Wisconsin mm -hmm. and it's right on the, right on the lake. So on a clear day, you can see downtown Milwaukee. You can see downtown Chicago. Dang. Lakes right there. Yeah. Um, and they're the, the jump zone that we use, fuck, we've been with them for like 2012. So we've been, we've, they've, they've jumped plenty of cripples. And they, yeah. they even bought the special, you know, harnesses and everything to yeah. um, make it completely safe. Um, that's, that's so neat, man. Yeah. So I think if you're feeling, if you're, you know, if you're up to it by the summertime, it's usually like in July or August. So if you're up for it. Love to have you out, especially yeah. to show you like just like the compound up there. Yeah, and then you know maybe get you into some scuba diving because that's that's kind of been dude. If I would have discovered scuba diving mm -hmm. when I first got hurt, mm -hmm. I I don't think I would have ever played rugby. Yeah, scuba diving is just yeah, it's uh it's definitely. I mean, I've done some scuba stuff before. Yeah, you know, uh, with veteran organizations where they just kind of put you in a swimming pool. Yeah, you know, and you're uh, you know even at Lakeshore, the, you know, they had a scuba uh, session in Lakeshore where they. Uh, took us into the water oh, uh, I didn't know the that. deep end at Lake Shore and, and uh, so I think that was one of the first times I was introduced to scuba diving. 
And uh, I, I mean, I I was probably I I, I ran out of air twice because I just oh. wanted, I just wanted to stay in the water. Yeah, you know, it was just so incredible. Are you able to use fins and kick? Um, a little. A yeah, little. I was able to use um my left leg pretty well. Um, but uh, you know, they had like those uh, underwater scooters. Oh no shit! Yeah, they had yeah, those underwater the, scooters. DPVs, right? Uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Yeah, it's just the little thing that you hold on to and di- just kind of diver like propulsion vehicle. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. So incredible! I I think the one that we used was uh, I don't know, I don't remember. That was probably Dude, like a Sea Dew or whatever. I freaking I I need to try one of those. And it was, I mean, it really felt like I was flying, man. Yeah, it was incredible. That was only in a pool, and that was in a pool. Yeah, you imagine open water yeah because i got this like vision where it's like i just want to get some like underwater headphones mm-hmm. and a dpv and twin tanks and just go rip it in the ocean listening to like motley crew <laughs> or something you know just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that sounds like a great time man but um so yeah th- things like that i'm 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 all about um if if i kind of go back to competitive sports where you know it's a team against a team or something like that um, you know, maybe depending on how my, my, my body comes back from this latest, uh, you know, thing that I'm dealing with. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it, there's just so much out there that you can do. You don't mm-hmm. have to v- compete at, you know, the highest level of, you know, some sport where yeah. you're competing for glory. You know, you don't, as long as you're out there having fun and, and you're keeping yourself in shape, you know, um, you know, go for it good advice for anyone really at any level damn that, yeah i think that's the perfect way to end the podcast Let's man do it man thanks yeah. again dude thanks, thanks. this has thanks, been Tim. awesome such a pleasure catching up yeah, dude likewise so. man all right y'all that's the uh that's the end of this one we'll catch y'all next time